Today is February 3rd, 2017. I'm Cindy Kelly, Atomic Heritage Foundation, and I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico, with uh, Clay K. Perkins. And I would like him to first say his full name and spell it. It's Clay, middle initial K for Kemper, last name Perkins, C-L-A-Y, K. P E R K I N S. Tell us about who you are. Where are you from? When were you born? Um, how, you know how you got interested in science. I was born in 1934, uh, and was a child during World War II. Uh, I played games of shooting Nazis and Japs. That's what we called them then. And everybody it was a perfect normal word. Uh, with my toy guns, uh, we would uh, run out to the park and uh, set up a fort and have a fight all day long. So we were very interested in the war. And at the end of the war, we heard about this new thing called the atomic bomb and how it ended the war. That got my focus on that particular part of science and then that spread to science in general. Uh, not long after the end of the war, maybe 40 and 45 probably, Life magazine, Look magazine, other popular type things put out articles on how the atomic bomb worked. Well, they weren't too detailed, but they were still fascinating to this young kid, 11 or 12 years old. And that got me to look forward to going into physics when I got to college, and I did. Uh, I learned how to make an, how to design an atomic bomb to calculate criticality, and then this new thing came along called space exploration. So instead of going into nuclear science, I went into rocket science, and did that for the first uh, oh ten or so years of my professional life. After that, uh, I changed over to. Uh, being a private consultant for business, and uh, subsequently went back into science for, for NASA and, and General Dynamics, where I had worked. Uh, uh, even after that, went back into building shopping centers and uh, making money so that I could then end up as a collector of marvelous things. I have three areas of collecting. One is ancient science books, starting uh, in the 15th, no, the 16th century. Uh, secondly, old world maps, starting in the 15th century. I have a copy of the oldest printed map of the world that exists. Uh, and then I went in as a child. My father was killed in an automobile accident when I was seven years old. He had been a, an ambulance driver in World War I, pretty exotic thing to drive a vehicle at that time. He uh, brought back a German Luger, the, the popularly seen pistol of the, of, the, of the evil Nazis and Germans in general. Uh, he died. I inherited the pistol at seven. and. Uh, was very quickly taking it apart and using the barrel with my toy soldiers to set up a fight on the battle on, battle scene on the floor. Uh, that got me interested in guns, and I bought some cheap relic pistols at the antique shops at, in my teenage years. I went through a period of 30 years of not paying much attention because I had these few guns that uh, I had collected as a teenager and my father's pistol. Uh, then when I retired at age 66 from formally going to the office, I said, oh, I'd like to get look at guns again. So I went, kind of turned up my collar and went to the uh, gun show because I was afraid somebody would see me and uh, think badly of me. So I ended up buying a, a couple of new pistols, 
and uh, there I was back into it. Uh, I've bought a few more since, and now uh, I have about 700 firearms. Uh, most are antiques, all are legal, but some are quite exotic, and uh, that was at the beginning of the weaponry. Well, there are other weapons, for heaven's sakes. There are clubs on one end and atomic bombs on the other, so let's get some clubs and atomic bombs. So now I've got four atomic bombs. Uh, two of them are high-quality, full-scale replicas, including a little boy. And the other two are uh, actually were, cre were, were real atomic bombs, but of course I only have the shell. In recent years, or maybe it's not so recent, you became very um, attached to reunions of the 509th composite group and interested in the Manhattan Project. My most, my, my most significant uh, collection, collecting item is a safety device that was on the little boy bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. It had three identical internal circuits for arming and firing the bomb. Each one had an electrical plug that could be removed and in exchanged for a, an arming plug. The safety plug was green, implying something nice, and the arming plug was red in danger. Uh, that, had, that plug had been owned by uh, Dick Jebson, who was the, uh, the bomb test officer, I believe he was called, on the Enola Gay. When he got back from the mission on Hirosh to Hiroshima, he met with his boss, who was a, a civilian a PhD named uh, Ed Dahl, and they said, oh, I've got these three green plugs, and I also I've got three red plugs that I had that were extra. Well, why do you take extras? Because if he had dropped one of the arming plugs behind the bomb on the bottom of the, of the bomb bay of the B-29, he couldn't have gotten it. So he was carrying extras. So he came back with extras. So they decided these were historical devices, important, and were, uh, labeled them very carefully and gave one set to Deke Parsons, who was uh, assistant, one of the assistant directors under Oppenheimer. And uh, one was kept by uh, Dr. Dahl, and one was taken by Dick Jebson. Uh, Dick kept his in a safe deposit until about 19, uh, 2002, and he decided it was time to see if he could raise some money for his grandchildren's college. And he put these up for auction in the uh, 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 auction house where I had bought a number of weapons, a number of pistols and rifles. Uh, and when I saw it, I went crazy. <laughs> oh, this is the grandest thing possible. Well, and that was subsequently supported by a survey that was done in the year 2000, asking people what was the most significant event of the 20th century. And by quite a margin, the most significant event was the bombing of, or the use of the atomic bomb. So I have a device that is inherently, critically, historically significant to uh, world history, and that pleases me no end. And as a result, I got uh, interested, in, uh, met, in fact, I talked to Dick Jebson even before buying it, and subsequently then went to a reunion of the 509th Composite Group which is the atomic bombers of World War II under Paul Tibbetts. Uh, I got to like these guys, and I had some ability to know what they were doing and what have you, and they ended up making me an honorary member. Um, so I've followed the nuclear stuff ever since I was 11 years old and read it, read it in the magazines up to joining 
the men who really did it. Uh, can you describe how innovative uh, the use of these safety plugs was? It was certainly not exotically uh, new, but it was a practical way to control what they wanted to do. The more exotic thing was the fact that the bomb, and this was true of Fat Man also, was ultimately fired by radar looking at the ground because the bombs had to explode high in the air to get the most blast effect. The radar that fired the bombs were four devices looking forward. They were actually tail radar detectors for fighter planes that were concerned about enemies coming up behind them. And they were converted and used for the bombs. The basic science that was new and important was the nuclear activity itself. And that started with Marie Curie and others early in the 20th century and came on up to... I saw a magazine article in the Saturday Evening Post, another popular magazine of the time, in the 1930s, I believe it was maybe 37, 38, uh, describing how to make an atomic bomb. This is understood. Physicists knew that you could do it. They didn't know how to do it, and it became an engineering problem, and that's where the innovation was, detailed in a, uh, engineering things. Now, the broader sense of innovation was that we have nuclear power as one of our major sources of electricity today, something that is considered risky, but in fact, if you look at the data and if you understand what goes on, it's the safest energy source we have other than standing in the sun to get warm. When the bomb is released, there are a series of steps that go through what you would call a computer, but it was an analog type of computer rather than a modern digital computer. Uh, initially, the bomb would fall away from the airplane and wa mechanical wires were pulled out of small mechanical clocks. These clocks would run for about 10 or 12 seconds and to allow the bomb to stop bouncing around and getting out of the airplane. They would then uh, turn on aeronoid uh, uh, pressure devices that were basically altitude readers. And then the altitude would be tracked as the bomb is falling comes out this way, noses over, and goes down. Uh, when it gets down in the 10,000 foot altitude region, the radars would be turned on. They were not turned on earlier because of the fear of its being detected by the Japanese. And the Japanese, in principle, might be able to send back a counter signal that would explode the bomb too soon. So they didn't want the Japanese knowing this existed even. So then they get down to maybe 10,000 feet, all four uh, radars would be turned on. They're looking down at, in front of them, getting nearly down and falling at very nearly the speed of sound, maybe 1,000 feet per second. So after they're turned on, there's only a few seconds before they're gonna say, oh, I'm now at 1,800 feet by looking at the bounced radar signal. And 1,800 feet is where we want to blow up the, the, bomb, the bomb. Well, the first one does that, nothing happens. It just says, get ready. The second one that detects it says, I see it too. And then the bomb is triggered and blows up at that time. And the third and fourth are backup. It's strictly backup. Yeah. Uh, High-speed cameras. Uh, there were commercially available cameras that would run uh, up to maybe 10,000 frames per second. That's 10,000 individual pictures in one second. That's very fast. They're going to call the fast hacks. Uh, they wanted to see in the, in many of the development steps of the bombs and, of course, in the actual explosion of the bomb that was tested at the Trinity site in New Mexico, 
uh, in more detail what, how things developed. Uh, they found that there was a camera in England called the Morley camera, for, for the name, based on the name of the man who invented it, and assembled it, used it for other things. Uh, and got the, brought the Marley camera over here to take pictures of the Trinity test. It turned out there actually were two cameras. Everyone thinks there's one, there was only one camera, but I did some research in a British library and found that there were two cameras here, and there was a hint that there actually was a third. I couldn't establish that. These things worked with a spinning wheel of little slots in front of a mass of individual cameras, so to speak. One piece of, of film, but uh, with multiple lenses. And the, the geometry of that allowed pictures to be taken up to 100,000 frames in one second, which, of course, is getting pretty interesting. You got a, a bomb that probably most of the all the reaction is taken has been occurs in less than a second, so now you can cover the whole thing pretty well. Well, that uh, camera was going to go down to the Trinity site and be a very important piece. Well, other people have been working on high-speed cameras too. Sometimes watch the same system, other systems, and by the time of the Trinity test, <laughs> the Morley was out of date, and. Uh, it was not used. It was used for other uh, operations in the developmental process, but it wasn't used for the, the famous ex first explosion. Uh, there is a place in Los Alamos, now long closed, called the Black Hole. The proprietor uh, had worked at Los Alamos and bought things from the scrap yard when it would be released uh, and developed a black hole in which you could reach and pull out almost anything. He had more junk and more interesting things than you could imagine. Well, he died and subsequently uh, a sort of selected part of his uh, huge, huge, this thing was so big he had it set up in a closed uh, supermarket uh, and then had to use uh, trailers outside of that to store things. At any rate, this batch of things that were particularly interesting were sold in bulk and I indirectly ended up with that and in it was not only a, a couple of fast hacks that I mentioned earlier, but also the Morley camera which we thought was the only one until I discovered there had been a second one. Uh, so I was very delighted with that. That was a sort of a big name thing that uh, shows how science and engineering work. You're going to do this and then something better comes along and you don't do it, you do the other thing. So at the Trinity site they had something like 37 um, movie <coughs> cameras going out? There are a lot of cameras yeah. for some general area coverage. They would use little uh, Kodak, I think they were called Cine Max or Cine something or other, uh, little cameras that were eight millimeter and were built and sold primarily for people to take pictures of their children or something of the sort, but they had set them up in a block in different focal length, different angles and things like that. Then the second batch was the fast tacks, which were these uh, big professional cameras carrying a lot of film that could run at low speeds, maybe 400 frames per second, or high speed at uh, 10,000, and they were scattered around the site. I don't know the number of cameras, but it was a lot. They were set up in bunkers behind uh, thick windows to protect the camera when they were close. And of course, it was the close cameras that were the most important. I've always been surprised that color cameras were not, or color film, 
wasn't being used. Uh, I think it indicates the science was we want to see what happens, not we want a pretty picture. Now, color makes things more readable. I had a personal experience in an experiment I did related to the weightlessness in space uh, where I had uh, liquids uh, in short-term weightlessness uh, on a drop test. And we used black and white film at first and we were having difficulty seeing what we wanted to see. And I decided to try to try color film. It made all the difference in the world. Now we were still to look at looking at liquid, sometimes water, sometimes liquid hydrogen, in a container. What what was the color? I mean, it, but it did show better because there are details in light that uh, are recorded in color that don't show black and white. It's very interesting. So. They didn't think about that, and in fact, maybe it wouldn't have made a difference in that particular use. The fellow that decided to take his own picture was Jack Abbey, and he uh, was the only one that took a color picture. Uh, it turned out to be a very flashy red picture with an interesting shape, and uh, it was an art piece as well as a, a bit of science. The pendulum is an interesting thing. Starting a little bit ahead of that, it was pretty well understood in the beginning of the bomb work that you could take two pieces of highly enriched uranium and put them together and they would blow up. Uh, but getting the highly enriched uranium was very difficult and it was discovered that they could convert uranium into plutonium, the second higher uh, atomic weight, atomic uh, number, and it would also blow up. And you could take two pieces and put it together and blow up. The only problem was the system of making the plutonium uh, up at, in, uh, in Washington State was uh, created some extra uh, isotopes of plutonium that were not the kind that would blow up. and they could not be separated practical, for practical purposes from the kind that they wanted and the kind they expected. So take two pieces, put them together, and they would start melting on the way together and come out and make them an ugly mess of radioactive uh, metal and no explosion, but uh, a very dangerous circumstance. So what are we going to do? Uh, we've got to bring them together faster because then you shoot them together in a gun, which is the way the little boy uh, did with, with uranium. Uh, that's slow by nuclear speeds, and they have time to start doing this meltdown confusion stuff. So how can, how can we do it faster? Well, uh, let's push it together with an explosion of chemical explosion material, uh, wrap it around, and there were several steps in doing it. They didn't jump immediately to that. But as soon as they got to the point of where, yeah, we think we know how we can control the chemical explosive to make it compress, now we got to run a test and find out does it do that? Because the earlier, some of the earlier tests that were done showed that the squeezing you might try to squeeze a sphere into a smaller sphere, but you'd end up squirting out two sides. It didn't, the engineering wasn't right. Uh, the handling of these explosions was very critical. We were talking about microseconds, uh, less than a microsecond. Uh, so how are we going to test it? Well, there were several ways. Uh, there was the raw law uh, test, which I won't get into that supplanted the pin dome. The pin domes are such a neat thing. Imagine your grandmother's uh, red uh, dome with pins and needles sticking out of it. That was the pin dome. But you know, these wires that were coming out were very small. They were maybe uh, two or three thousandths of an inch in diameter. Uh, 
coming out just like grandmother's pen dome, all the same length, so it made a, a sphere. And each wire was electrically connected to an oscilloscope. And you could then tell when the explosion hit it. So the explosion, let me say, is uh, conductive. When you have a, a, a fire or a, an explosion, you have uh, ions that are electrically conductive as part of the explosion. And so if you keep a, a electrical contact to the outside of the explosion, this is an implosion. You're coming together like this, whereas you can keep an electrical connection to the explosion itself. When it comes in, and this wire, you know, all these wires, this wire is hit by this electrically conductive face of the explosion, it will send a signal. And that signal can be recorded on an oscilloscope. And you have a whole bank of oscilloscopes, because you maybe have several hundred wires, and you, got, you can require, record several on each oscilloscope. Still got a lot of oscilloscopes. And then you would find out this wire fired at uh, 1.2 microseconds, and this one didn't fire till 1.3 microseconds. And this one over here fired at 0.5 microseconds. Well, that's going to be very unbalanced, so you have to keep working. Now, I ended up getting off the internet a pack of three or four pin domes from Los Alamos. And if I saw it being advertised, it was unclear what it was. I did a little studying, and oh yeah, that's pretty neat. And I bought them. So I was at a party at what was then the National Atomic Museum, the same place as we are here. And I was talking to a nuclear scientist from Kirtland. Uh, and uh, I said, I, oh, I had this picture. I said, yeah, I got this, sand, this pendulum. Oh, and I said, what, what can you tell me about it? I can't talk about it. Why not? It's still uh, secret. And you shouldn't have that. I said, well, I got this off the internet. <laughs> and like so many things about the early atomic bombs, there's a lot of stuff that has no reason to still be classified. It is, but the rabbit's out of the hat, and everybody knows about it. But this guy didn't know that it was, it was common because he was working where they had guards and people checking on him. Well, all us guys outside didn't worry about that. I was the first activity of the museum that I attended, and I would guess it was roughly 2006 or something like that. I, I don't, don't know. But the pendulum was a really neat idea, and they're, they're awfully cute. Uh, as I said, they look like grandmother's uh, pin cushion. Pin cushion, that's the right word. Right. Pin cushion. Right. Right. We used to have one. <laughs> Red, of course. Pin dome or pin cushion? Uh, pin cushion. All <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, right. Now, the other things you wanted to, to talk about in your collection are the little boy. Well, I already talked a lot about Little Boy when okay. we were talking about the radar and mm -hmm. the, the sequence for firing. But uh, at 9-11, some Congress people, I think mostly senators, decided that the real Little Boys that were on display, there were six or seven of them around the U.S. and one in England, uh, were a serious security risk because uh, terrorists could come and steal the bomb and blow us up some way or other. Well, these were not technical people and did not understand that it wouldn't do them any good at all. Uh, even dissecting it and determining all, all of the dimensions, etc., wasn't going to make any real difference to the ability of terrorists to develop a bomb. Uh, but they put pressure on the Department of Energy, and the Department of Energy said all those have to be taken off of display. 
Well, I was at Los Alamos for at the uh, Bradbury Museum when they got a replica that was made by a fellow in East Texas. Uh, very good, very good replica, very well made. And I was there because I had the, the, the safety plug from the little boy, and we were showing them together, and I was part of the, the proceedings. Uh, I got to know him. I thought, you know, I would like to do that, but what, what do you charge? Well, it was, I don't know if he gave me an exact number, but it was tens of thousands of dollars to make this model a uh, replica, full size, very accurate. I don't know about that, so I kept thinking about it, and as I got older, I realized that I had fewer years than I did money, and that I could afford to have one because I would really like it. And so I contracted with him, and I paid him somewhere between twenty and twenty-five thousand dollars for the thing. But it, it's like having a handmade automobile. Uh, the exterior is done perfectly in terms of dimension, etc. The, the, the bomb uh, the replica is just that, a replica, except for the electrical hookups for the monitoring system that allowed the uh, Dick Jebson in the, inside the airplane to check to see if electrical things were working properly. Uh, they actually came out of leftover uh, inventory from the Manhattan Project. So part of it is real, <laughs> part of it is replica, most of it is replica. That's great. Um, let's see. The two things we want to talk about are <clears throat> your involvement with Los Alamos and the Beta House and your friendship with Harold Agnew. Um, and maybe as a prelude to that, you could talk just in general why you think uh, preserving the history of the Manhattan Project and its legacy is important. It's a significant part of history. I think everybody acknowledges that, even those that are unreasonably concerned about things nuclear. Uh, it is important. Uh, and in general, we save important things when we can because we learned from the past. Uh, and they're interesting. So there are two reasons. As a result, I have collected a number of interesting things, some extremely special, like the uh, arming plug and uh, safety plug, uh, others less so, but still interesting. Uh, and that it led me to make friends with people in Los Alamos and there is a very fine, uh, probably the best one in the world, uh, of a local history society preserving everything that's going on in their town. Of course, most uh, people there have PhD grandparents. So <laughs> it makes it, uh, these, are, these are very well, very smart people in general. So I got involved, and my initial interest was to try to uh, put forward the plan to make a part of the Los Alamos Labs area where the little boy was developed, a spot called Gun Site, because that was developing the internal gun in the, uh, uh, in the bomb, uh, could be open to the public. And I worked off and on for several years with people there some through the Bradbury and some employees of the uh, of the labs, and it went along and it went along and it didn't really get very far. And I had offered to make a very large donation to get the work done. Uh, well, that never came about <laughs> because uh, not only did it, I wasn't ready to do it because they weren't really ready to get get it done, uh, they discovered they weren't allowed to take my contribution. They still haven't gotten the uh, gun site prepared to be used, but 
maybe with the uh, new national park connection, that can get be can yet be uh, be done. I looked for something else and discovered that the local history society was looking for some support. <laughs> I discovered they came to me, <laughs> beat me over the head. Uh, to understand what I'm going to say, you have to remember that there was a series of, of uh, small houses used for the teachers at, uh, called masters at the uh, Los Alamos School for Boys. And they were in a row. There were, depends on how you count them, uh, five, six, or seven of these buildings, cottages. Uh, uh, and they were kind of complete houses. They had bedrooms and bathrooms, and the bathrooms had bathtubs. Well, when the Army took over Los Alamos, they had those buildings could be used, uh, and they started building buildings for all the scientists, engineers, and support people coming into the city, uh, to the, the secret city hill, hidden on the hill. Uh, they weren't too interested in good quality housing. They just needed housing quick. So none of the housing had bathtubs. Only bathtubs in Los Alamos during the war were these six buildings, six cottages. And they were known as bathtub row because only uh, Oppenheimer and other top people uh, were assigned to those buildings. And there was a certain amount of jealousy because some people really liked baths. And people, friends of, of those leaving there would sometimes say, can I come over and take a bath? And they did get some baths that way. So it was known as bathtub roll. The city of, La Mesa, of uh, Los Alamos changed the name of that st or the street that was put in later, which I think was a num numbered street, uh, finally changed it officially to bathtub roll. So back to the story about uh, what I was doing. Uh, there was Oppenheimer's house. That was not the designated uh, number one by, uh, by the school originally. And next to it was number two, which was occupied both by Ed McMillan during the war and at the end of the war by Hans and Beta. Both of these men won Nobel Prizes for their work. Uh, and it became known as the Beta House for the second of the two. Uh, Hans Beta was a very personable fellow. He was a uh, German. So we have Hans Bethe as the second uh, uh, one that lived in the house during the, the Manhattan Project. He was in charge of theor the theory group, and he was also a very uh, congenial fellow who everybody liked. Uh, he was a, a, a jolly fellow and uh, a quite marvelous guy who won a Nobel Prize in 1967 uh, for interpreting how our sun works. Why does we have this hot thing up in the sky, which we have to have or we die? And he interpreted the, the hydrogen fusion process that's involved in the sun. And it was really quite a remarkable uh, event. So the uh, so history society or historical society uh, owned uh, some buildings along this group uh, and the owner of the Oppenheimer house, I should say that these houses were originally just rented at a cheap price to the occupant, but at the end of the war they were put up for sale and they were bought. Uh, and the owner, for a long time, made a, a contribution withholding a life interest to the historical society. And uh, Mrs. Saddam is still living there and doing well in her 90s. Uh, and 
they look, the Historical Society looks forward to getting that house. Well, they did kind of like to have the Beta House that's next door, and they were looking for funding for that. And my wife Dorothy and I contributed the money necessary to buy the house and to repair a great deal of damage that existed uh, and put it into shape and a little bit of extra money to help establish the muse uh, museum. And the plan was, which appealed to me greatly, was to make it the Harold Agnew Civil, uh, uh, the Harold Agnew Cold War Gallery was a part of the museum because it had become a substantial area of it. And little was available about what was going on in Los Alamos during the Cold War. And of course, a lot was going on at the labs. Harold Agnew was a late in life friend of mine. Uh, I met him, I believe, in about 2002, and he died, what, two years ago, 2014 or 15. Uh, he lived only about a 10 minute drive away from me, so uh, we got together and found we had shared interests. And uh, uh, I mean, Harold's background is fantastic. Uh, you can look it up on this website elsewhere. But to summarize it, he was a, had a physics degree at the time of the beginning of the, uh, the work for the bomb. Uh, Harold Agnew, with his degree in physics, worked for Enrico Fermi, who was the Italian later uh, Nobel winner, who worked, who set up and operated and proved the nuclear possibilities by developing what was called the Chicago Pile, and really Chicago Pile number one, because they had some others after that. This was an assembly of uh, graphite and uranium, and they actually got it to start building up runaway power until they shut it down. Uh, Harold even lived, Harold, I believe, it, and his wife, uh, lived for a short time, a few months, with the Fermis, uh, which must have been a marvelous thing for a young physics student. Uh, he then came to Los Alamos. He worked on the system to measure the Im uh, implosion size of the bombs, a device that was dropped from a plane that accompanied the little of uh, the, uh, uh, the bomber. Uh, and would measure the impact of uh, the shock wave. Um, he then later went back and got a PhD at the University of Chicago and went back to Los Alamos and worked there. Uh, he, I believe at that point, before he, he became the third director of the, the project after uh, Oppenheimer and uh, uh, Bradbury. And then at some point in there, he was the American science specialist to NATO. Uh, I think that was before he was director. Well, I, let me have those backwards. Uh, he retired uh, in the 70s as director after like seven years. And when asked what, later in life ask what did you contribute and what, what, what did you do in your life? And he said, well, to sum it all up, I oversaw the development of three-fourths of the American nuclear weapons. Uh, and that was really what he did. Uh, but he was a brilliant guy. I knew him very well. And he lived a long and happy life until his wife died when he was uh, 89 or 80 or something like that. Uh, no, late 80s. Late 80s. Uh, after that, uh, he was not, you know, he, was, he really, he had married her as a teenager and they had been together for <laughs> what, uh, 70 years or something of the sort. Um, 
he, uh, I took him out to uh, lunch, oh, once a month perhaps, and had him to our house uh, in the evenings occasionally, which he particularly enjoyed because my wife Dorothy is a fine cook and he really liked uh, her cooking. So I finally saw him on a Tuesday. I looked in my calendar recently and checked it. Was on a Tuesday, took him to lunch. Uh, he enjoyed it, uh, and I got word then the following that the following Sunday he died. His grandson came to see him, perhaps because he couldn't answer the phone. Went in, and Harold was sitting in an easy chair in front of a TV watching a football game, uh, and he died. I want to tell you about something that I, is, is speculative that I'm working on right now. The, when the critically important test that would the bomb actually blow up, which was not a test of the physics, it was a test of the engineering, took place in southern New Mexico at, at the what's called the Trinity site now. The explosion wasn't a bomb, it couldn't be dropped out of an airplane, but it was the, the, basically the same internal parts that formed Fat Man. It couldn't just set it on the ground and blow it up because the, half of the surrounding area was solid earth and that's not like a bomb explodes in the air. So they put it on top of a tower that was 100 feet tall. That tower evaporated, it was steel, but the tower evaporated in the power and temperature of the heat of the, of the explosion of the test, and nothing is left but a little bit of one or two of the footings for the, for the tower. It suddenly occurred to me that you really ought to put back a tower there. Uh, that would explain to the people a lot about what was going on. So I contacted the uh, people that run the White Sands um, Missile Range who oversee this uh, site and suggested that I would uh, support doing that and pay for it. Uh, and they took a little while to go through the, the bureaucracy and ended up with somebody in uh, the, uh, the, the national parks system whose name I will not use. But he announced that, uh, oh no, we can't do that and gave me reasons that I thought were absurd that I won't go into here because it's the, the idea that I want to push. And that is that I now am thinking about doing it at the National Atomic Museum, which is now called the National Nuclear Museum, I guess. Is that right, Cindy? For, for science and history. Yeah. <laughs> Any rate. Uh, <laughs> I like the old name. Uh, so there, the director of the museum, Jim Walter, and I have been talking about putting up one in part of the, as part of the museum. Uh, we are waiting now to see if we can get clearance from the FAA because after all, we're fairly close to an airport and this is 100 feet tall. Well, luckily, he's already got a 70 foot tall uh, redstone sticking up in the air. Uh, so we're not trying to go too much taller. Maybe we'll get it approved. And maybe we'll be able to do this as a, as a next project. So I keep trying to, to do these things. Great. So your interest continues. Yes. All this work I've done on uh, nuclear history and the history of the Manhattan Project uh, has been a wonderful uh, activity. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It started after I had retired from full-time activities in business. I, pay, I, I paid a, a large sum for the safety plug. It was well worth it because I re received its value back many times over in contacts I've had with people. Uh, for example, I knew the last, got to know very well, the three last surviving members of the Enola Gay crew 
uh, Paul uh, Tibbetts, Dutch Van Kirk, the navigator, and Dick Jebson, the, the bomb, safe, safe bomb test officer. And then outside of that, uh, people that have collected around the veterans uh, and have, for various reasons, been elected to uh, be honorary members uh, have been wonderful. Bob Krause is a leader in many respects for uh, contacts with the veterans and uh, organizing the an annual reunion of the 509. Uh, Joel Papalia uh, has been a supplier of a great many uh, uh, paper, paper parts of collections. Um, Jim Peterson uh, operates the Wendover Airfield and works very hard at reproducing the, uh, the old buildings there. Um, Glenn McDuff is a retired nuclear bomb PhD in Los Alamos, and he and I have been, done a lot of nice things together. Robert Norris, who is the author of Racing for the Bomb, I believe it's subtitled The Indispensable Man, speaking of General Groves. Uh, it's a very detailed, heavy, long book, and there really isn't any history about Groves other than what he wrote. And John Coster Mullen, who has written the most uh, detailed book about Little Boy and Fat Man called Atomic Bombs, uh, called Atomic Bombs, Little Boy and Fat Man, and then some other words. It's a rather long title. These people have all been good friends of mine and uh, made my life a lot more fun. And I enjoy the history, they enjoy the history, and we enjoy it together.